Have you ever felt like your wedding planning is a test you didn't study for? Or that there are rules and expectations about weddings that you had no idea about until you got engaged? If so, you are not alone. The unspoken etiquette of weddings trips up a lot of unsuspecting couples. And trust me when I say that more than a couple of disagreements have happened because of cross communication and hurt feelings that come from someone intending one thing and a friend or family member taking it completely another way. But today, my friend, you are in luck. Jamila Mosieva is a certified etiquette teacher, a three times author on etiquette, and a YouTube creator with nearly a million subscribers whose main focus is modern international etiquette. Jamila's approach intertwines personal development, female empowerment, and cultural appreciation, and strikes that delicate balance between progressive living and preserving traditions. Most of the time, Jamila is teaching etiquette to ambassadors and young diplomats, as well as through her books, online courses, and events. But today, she's going to help you sort through the maze of wedding etiquette, including who defines the rules of etiquette and who pays for and or organises the engagement party and wedding events. And in fact, Jamila had so much knowledge to share that I know you're going to love. So to make sure that you get the most out of her interview, what I've done is I've split it into two sections for you with part one this week and part two next week. Now, to be honest, you kind of need the background and understanding about wedding etiquette from this episode to really get the most out of next week. But would it pique your interest a little to know that next week, Jamila goes into the dilemma of how you ask for cash instead of gifts and what to do if you've invited someone to your engagement party or maybe given them a save the date and then you don't want to invite them to your wedding? How good is that? Her answers are brilliant as well. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Unbridely is a community of pro wedding vendors who believe in freedom and integrity in weddings, giving you options, solutions, tips and tricks to create the experience and memories that you and your fiancé really want and deserve. Because we believe that weddings are a team sport. With how-tos, stories and interviews with recently married couples, we find out what went right and what they'd change if they could go back and do it all over again. I'm Camille and welcome to the Unbridly Podcast. Hi, Jamila, and welcome to the Unbridly Podcast. Thank you so much, Camille, for having me. I'm so thrilled to chat with you because I have a little bit of background about your extensive First of all, knowledge and then teaching in etiquette. And of course, the background of weddings is all about tradition and etiquette. And so we want to try and work out how we can balance what has been done in the past and what is expected now in this day and age. But before we go into all of that, the listener really wants to know a bit about you, a bit about your background and what you do and where you're from. Thank you for your lovely introduction. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. I was born and raised here in Baku, Azerbaijan, which is a small but rather beautiful, mighty country. I love to say it like that. Very rich, mighty in terms of its culture and traditions. Very rich cultural heritage. And um, so it's in between Europe and Asia. Uh, so I was born and raised in this country, already exposed to different cultures and different traditions, as well as different languages. I grew up already speaking four languages. And then, you know, by the time I was, you know, a certain age, I already spoke like six different languages. So sure. Yeah, just traveling and, and, you know, studying abroad. So then at the age of 16, I moved to the United States to attend the George Washington University. I did my bachelor's in international relations and actually double minored in sociology and history. 
And then I moved to Europe, to Belgium, to pursue my master's degree in European administration and politics. And so I came back to my country, got married, had two kids. And while I was doing that, <laughs> while well, I also taught at Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy. Um, and usually most of my classes were about the European Union. Uh, and I started introducing some classes in etiquette. And I thought, why not get certified in etiquette? So I did my certification in London, in the International Protocol and Etiquette Academy of London. And then I just started just teaching etiquette because it has always been my passion. I've always loved learning about cultures and differences and traditions. And so it just paved my way into what I'm doing right now. It's a, it's a huge passion. It's a huge curiosity on my part. And uh, when pandemic hit, I actually uh, stopped teaching in person and started teaching online, which is why I founded my YouTube channel, which now has about almost a million followers uh, where I teach about etiquette, soft skills, self-development, sometimes some things about like my own country. I share the traditions and the cultures because I want other people to get to know more about where I'm coming from. So that's about me. <laughs> it's a long one. It's incredible, Jamila. It's incredible. And with your YouTube channel, of course, I've had a quick look through like some of your most popular videos and they're fascinating. You've got me absolutely hooked. So what I will do is with your contact details, I'll put them in the show notes of this podcast episode so everyone can jump down there, click on and follow you as well. But yeah, one of the videos that I really loved was how to say no. Yeah, it's a hard one. It sounds ridiculously simple, but of course it's not. So I'll put the links there. And also you skipped over the books that you've written. They really are like my babies. I love them. Obviously, every author loves the book that they've produced because it takes your time, energy, knowledge. The reason I actually decided to write a book is when I was studying etiquette in London, I went to the best bookstores in London. And I believe me, Camille, I couldn't find a lot of books on etiquette. I could find a lot of books on gardening, cooking, (laughs) yoga, meditation, how to breathe. How to do anything. How to do anything. There were like tarot cards, like astrology, astronomy, anything, you name it, you know? And when I asked uh, the salesperson to show me the etiquette book section, there were only like three, four books. And some of them were back from the days by Emily Post, which is a great, she's a great source for etiquette. And obviously every etiquette instructor has read her books. But then there wasn't something that was just brief to the point that I can get just grab mm-hmm. and if I'm about to meet in-laws. So I really wanted a book that would just give me the basics and I couldn't find it. Um, so I decided, you know, if there is nothing in the market like that and I'm searching for it, why not create it? And that's how the first book, Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know, was written. And the reason I wrote it like that, like Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know, it just covers the basic. I'm not going into in-depth history of why things are the way they are. This book is just for you to have it at your table in case you have to go to a formal dinner, if you need to know what to wear, what dress codes mean. Um, And then the other two books, Afternoon Tea Etiquette, actually came about with my love for afternoon tea. Um, And I decided why not make a whole book about it because I love it. And it's a really nice book to give to, especially young ladies love it because afternoon tea is such a a ladylike thing to do. Like if a girl is turning 16, you know, it's a nice gift to give her. It's a really cute and they have like uh, beautiful illustrations. And then The Art of Entertaining at Home, which is my latest book. It came about this summer. I thought, you know, some people are asking me, you know, I'm having in-laws over, I'm having friends over. How do I set up a table? How do I greet guests? And so this was just, again, a short book with a lot of illustrations and, and the basics of how to set up a table for different seasonal decorations and as well how to host people over, as well as how to be a gracious guest. So it's being a good guest, but also mm. keep being a good host. And also it comes with an online course. So you can watch the course and also read the book and help to visualize the things I'm explaining in the book. I mean, you've said, you know, it's kind of basic, but surely that is the most practical information that people can possibly get their hands on when they need that information. Because when you're going, okay, the in-laws are coming over, I'd really love to know how to do a beautiful table spread, how to really set it out and do it properly. Mm -hmm. In that moment, you don't want to know the history of etiquette. You just want to know how to do it and how to do it as efficiently as possible. Exactly. So it sounds good. It sounds practical and relevant. And yes, so we'll put the links in the show notes there. And yeah, your history is amazing. I could talk to you for hours, but let's get down to weddings. Let's 
talk about how etiquette intersects weddings because my opinion runs deep about etiquette and weddings. But tell the listener, Jamila, what does etiquette mean to you in this day and age? Camille, to me, etiquette is always relevant. And the reason I'm saying it, I always say that etiquette evolves with country, with culture, with history, with fashion, with tradition, with uh, the days of life and norms of life. Thinking of etiquette as something archaic is not correct because you think of an old ways of doing it. It was the etiquette of those days. And then we have modern day etiquette, which is relevant to our time and age. In 10 years time, there are going to be some new things out in life and there are going to be etiquette rules pertinent to those new things in life. An example I always bring in my class is the idea of netiquette, which is online etiquette. Online didn't exist 50, 60 years ago. So there wasn't even such a term in old books, netiquette. There wasn't emailing etiquette. There wasn't phone etiquette. There wasn't Mm. like social media etiquette. Uh, For example, old books have things about fax etiquette, which is something the modern day time people won't understand. What is faxing? Like, what are you talking about? What gadget is that? No one uses fax anymore, but there was a whole section on fax etiquette. How do you fax in the right manner at the right time? So that is irrelevant, but that is not to say that etiquette is not relevant. It's still relevant, but now to other things out in life. And so for me, etiquette is really the playbook of life that makes it easier for you. So you don't have to fret about how do I handle this? How do I go about this? You know how it's done within the social accepted norms. And then you just feel comfortable being yourself or doing what else that you want to do. So I always say meeting in-laws by the mere fact of it is a very nerve wracking situation. So add to it the stress of how do I handle my utensils is going to spike up your overall anxiety. So when you know how you're handling yourself at a table, the only thing you need to worry about is, you know, seeing your in-laws. If you know how to talk, what to talk about, you'll know about the art of small talk. You won't even fret about how do I handle a conversation because you know what you can talk about. So etiquette is just ways of living and making life much easier by being respectful, kind to other people around you. Because it's so much more than just rules, isn't it? It's a form of expression and communication, but it's it's respectful and it's an understood and appreciated form of communication that sort of goes beyond language, which is so fascinating. And so what part does etiquette play in today's modern weddings, Jamila? Well, I think weddings are the most traditional ceremony that is left of, of of the way we live life. You know, a lot of things in our lives have developed so much or progressed so much that we have lost touch with the past traditions versus I think weddings are kind of like the big element or the big event in life that still holds on to a lot of traditions. No matter how liberal you are, no matter how progressive you are, the ways that you are doing your wedding is most likely more closer to a traditional way Mm -hmm. than not. So etiquette is just Knowing etiquette or incorporating etiquette into wedding makes you, if you are bride and groom, or if you're a guest, uh, be so much less nervous about how to handle things, how to go around things. So uh, the way I understand it is that when we are doing things following etiquette, there is really little gap there that we can make a wrong impression or that we can hurt someone's feelings, you know, Mm. or we can do something that will be disrespectful towards someone. So it's almost like having this safe life jacket on you, knowing that you're doing the things in the most correct way. So you can avoid having, you know, miscommunication or you can avoid having this little mishaps in the way that you handle someone. So it's just like a very safe way to handle a big event in your life. Which is so incredibly needed when you're dealing with so much with weddings what we're finding at the moment is, especially post-COVID, there is a bit of a clash between different generations, between different cultures, between different social classes and their expectations and what they think is right, in inverted commas. It can be an incredibly tense time from engagement through to the wedding. As I said, I could talk to you all day. So let's get down to some specifics. Mm -hmm. Let's have a chat about, because there were in times past, 
really quite strict customs, traditions, etiquette around the different events for a wedding. So going through the engagement party, the bridal shower, the bachelorette or hens or however you'd like to call it, your rehearsal dinner, the wedding, and whether there's a post-wedding brunch, Mm -hmm. breakfast, something like that, and who would pay for it. And so in modern etiquette, as you were discussing before, Jamila, who now pays for these things and hosts these things? Where do you think these etiquettes come from and who who directs this really? You know, who who gets to decide what is etiquette now? So, you know, if you're talking about these different events, you know, so for example, the engagement party, what would you consider the etiquette is around who would host and pay for an engagement party? So just to go back a step before I answer this question is that who defines the the rules of etiquette when it comes to, you know, things in life like wedding or social etiquette or business etiquette. And the answer to that is that life or circumstances or that is historical events. So decisions, laws, and social norms and social traditions, they're all intertwined to create what the new reality is. And then the new reality has its own rule book. It's almost like if you think about it, like if you're playing a game, a computer game, if it's updated, there are new rules that you play by and then it's updated again and then you you have new rules. So etiquette just creates itself from these different intertwined circumstances that create new playbook rules. So it's just about educating yourself of what is the correct way of doing things in this current moment and time and the place is very important because again etiquette is different from culture to culture traditionally engagement parties would be handled financially by bride's family so it's the bride's family that would handle take over the the party finances and it's usually a much smaller group of people that are invited to it a very close knit family you know relatives some dear colleagues and it's not just only true for US, Australia, Western part of the world, but also to Middle East and Azerbaijan as well. Engagement parties, no matter how wealthy the groom is, the engagement party is pretty much always handled by the bride's family. So they are in charge of it. In regards to the wedding, which is something I want to raise because there, cross-culturally, it's different. Mm-hmm. In US, I think it comes from the traditional dowry, the understanding that it's the bride's family that pays for the wedding as well. Majority of the finances are taken over by them. Uh, Back in the days, again, modern etiquette is different. I will talk about it. Whereas in Azerbaijan, traditionally, the wedding would most often covered by the groom's family. So it's the groom's family that has to financially take over the wedding. Right. It's not the bride's family. And Mm. so... It's interesting because it's, it's, I mean, there is no right or wrong way. It's just one part of the world does it one way and the other does it differently. And the reason they're doing it, it comes again from the historical circumstances of, of the way the traditions unfolded. In modern time, regardless of where you are in the world, and because the world has become so globalized, we're so connected to each other, we take over each other's cultural, nitpick certain things and, and try to ad- adapt it to our own reality. In today's modern world, there is no strict rules as to who has to cover the financial uh, costs. It is whoever has the means to do so. It could even be bride and groom themselves. They might not want to burden their parents or perhaps their parents are not working anymore and can handle those financial costs. So then the bride and groom, sometimes it could be, you know, maybe groom's grandparents or bride's grandparents that want to gift this to them. So it's really then up to whoever can afford it. Um, But then if if both families can afford it and both of them want to contribute, why not? You know, it's all then part of communication and talking through who gets to cover what. Um, and I think communication is the key when it comes to planning the wedding and just life in general. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's face facts. You've always been the planner and the organizer. And your fiancé's eyes glaze over a little when you start talking about the details of your wedding day. But you really need someone to share this all with, to bounce ideas off, and someone who's not going to ruin the surprises, but also be supportive and maybe even offer a different perspective. 
So when you're needing to get a second opinion about your bridesmaid, your in-laws or your first dance song, Unbridly Couples is your safe space. Unbridly hosts a private Facebook community where modern engaged couples can share ideas, chat and solve problems and generally just get freaking excited about their wedding. We also have a curated list of experienced wedding vendor professionals in there to offer suggestions and tips, insight into how to get the most out of your big day. But with no unsolicited DMs or pushy sales tactics, it's just not what Unbridly is about. So you can search for the Unbridly Couples Group on Facebook or just click on the link in the show notes. I'll see you in there. Because, of course, as well as all the emotions that go on with the wedding, one of the biggest stresses, I believe, is the talk about money because things have evolved. You're right. You know, etiquette could be one thing 10 years ago and another thing now and another thing in 10 years' time. And that understanding, sometimes not everyone has the full picture. So there could be parents who still believe, yes, we're going to pay for our child's wedding. It could be the um, people who are getting married just going, no, actually, we don't want any contributions. This is just us. And we'd like something really small. And then the grandparents saying, no, you can't have something really small. We've got to invite everyone we've ever met because that's the right thing to do. It's, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a tangled, tangled web. But yeah, money conversations can be very difficult, I think, Jamila. Have you got any insight into, yeah, that conversation about who is paying for what? I think it's, you know, money conversations are always difficult, not just for weddings. They're difficult for, you know, when you are agreeing on your salary, when you want to raise, when you want to ask someone to help you with something, if you're asking for money, it's always a tough thing to ask. Uh, but I think when we are merging families, this is something we need to learn to talk about and, um, Also, I think what is a good way of handling the conversation around it is at least agreeing in terms of the budget range. So rather than specifically saying you pay this much and I pay this much, agreeing on what could be a total budget that we could have for this wedding. And then, you know, uh, say the wedding of our dreams would cost us I don't know, 100,000, I don't know, $10,000, you know, whatever it is. Then once we've agreed on a budget, we could talk about who is handling what part of the budget or what percentage of the budget. And then one thing, Camille, is important to remember is whoever pays gets to decide. And so whoever pays gets to decide the kind of a wedding they're going to have. Is it going to be a big one like grandparents want because they're paying for it? It's going to be a small one because we're paying for it and we can't afford more. Mm. Um, so it's usually then up to the person financially covering the coast that gets to decide majority of, you know, who's going to make the guest list, how big the wedding is going to be. Um, it's something there is no easy way out from talking about money and budget, but it's the one thing that is best is at least talking about the threshold above which we cannot afford. Uh, and mm. it's about being honest with that threshold. Um, so, and then you can work around the budget. So if the budget is up to $10,000, you could talk about five or seven or eight. It's then much more easier to navigate rather than when you have no idea of what mm. you're looking for. And then, you know, maybe someone is thinking about hundred and the other is just about 10. So then there's a huge one, you know? Oh yes. There's a huge disparity there. <laughs> There's disparity. It's very hard to understand what you're envisioning. Uh, But when you have a budget limit, and that's also, uh, this works for anything in life, you know, Um, when you are talking about salary as well, what is Mm -hmm. the raise you're looking for? And it's 100 or 10. You know, when you give a sort of expectation of what you want, then you can work within that range. Um, So it's just about being honest and talking about what your true financial uh, capabilities are um, and not I, I've seen people that would go into debt in order to make a wedding. Um, yes. And if anyone is listening to this and I'm married uh, and I have two kids, I'll tell you this. Um, the money you spend on your wedding, I would rather use it to create a home, you know, get myself things that I want to have because the first year of having a family is going to be tough on you. And so I have seen the most beautiful weddings end up in a divorce and I've seen the most uh, very small, you know, 
not a big the deal. Wedding yes. into very beautiful families. So the cost of your wedding is not going to be equivalent to your happiness in your marriage. Um, so if you just think about it, I understand it's a big occasion in life. You want to have the best of everything, which is great, which is also something that I endorse. But I wouldn't say to overstretch yourself uh, to just make sure that you have a, an amazing party for others because you have to think about life that comes after the wedding. I love that so much, Jamila. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's such an important message that good as our intentions are around getting married and having the best of everything and making it something really special because it is a once in a lifetime event, going into debt is a real line with getting married. And yeah, having the wedding that's within your means is so, so valuable for so many different reasons. And I've got an entire podcast about it. So I'm going to link that in the show notes again. And if you're going, oh, but it's just going to be a little loan, I'd love you to listen to this podcast first and just, yeah, get your head around some of the facts and figures around it and understand that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it's enough. It's more than enough. That's such a good point. Thank you, Jamila. Okay. So the engagement party, if we're going traditional bride groom, then maybe the bride's family would take care of it. But whoever has the financial means then gets the say in how big and where we're having it and things like that. So that's fascinating. What about, so in American culture in the United States, we actually don't have it here in Australia. In Azerbaijan, do you have a rehearsal dinner before your wedding? We don't, no. Oh, that's interesting. So around the rehearsal dinner, I've heard that if it's a bride and groom getting married, it's the groom's family who take care of it. Yes, and most likely it is the case uh, because already wedding is such a huge burden on the bride's family that now the rehearsal dinner. So it would be fair that at least groom covers part of something because right. if we are talking about American culture and tradition, if it's a traditional way, then the bride is covering the wedding and the groom is mm. covering the rehearsal dinner. Rehearsal dinner is something that I have only encountered in the U.S. and that is now slowly incorporated in modern families, even in East and Middle East and um, just Europe in general. So it's something that I guess is a way for guests to connect with each other before they step into the actual ceremony at the wedding. Um, bear in mind, I think this is because also in the United States, you have your family scattered all over the States. So they haven't seen each other in such a long time. And mm -hmm. them coming together, rehearsal is kind of not just rehearsal of the wedding, it's not a, of the wedding, but rather for people to chat, you know, catch up, to have this like ease into sort of ice break after mm -hmm. they haven't seen each other in a while, the family members that live all over different states. And then when they come together at the wedding, they've already, you know, caught up at that night before. So on this day, they can just enjoy and have fun at the wedding. This is not really the case in our country. We don't have a rehearsal dinner because, you know, Azerbaijan is a small country. So everyone is coming for pretty much, they've probably seen each other last week. So there's no real reason for a rehearsal dinner. Yes, of course, of course. I think when you have a destination wedding and when you have a lot of people coming over from all different parts of the world, which is something I've seen happen when it's a wedding in the US and you have friends from all over the world, or it's a wedding that I attended of a friend of mine in Malaysia. Uh, so she is from Malaysia and they are Muslims. So Muslims usually don't have a traditional rehearsal dinner, but they've incorporated that because they had a lot of people, family and friends traveling from all over the world to their uh, engagements. It was an engagement party. Uh, so, and then they had the wedding as well in the same manner. So this is kind of a way for the guests to connect with each other and really have this time to catch up so that at a wedding, they're actually not chatting with each other and catching mm -hmm. up, but rather feeling it easy and already just enjoying the time. Yeah. It's smart. Again, it's practical. Mm -hmm. It's modern. It's really considering the needs of the guests who are coming together, they need to say hi. They need to find out what's going on in each other's lives. Exactly. And then they can put that behind them and enjoy the wedding celebration that's there. Yeah, it makes really good sense. So in a bridegroom wedding, the groom's family traditionally would pay for that. But I guess, again, whoever's got the money, whoever wants to put forward you know, those funds and talking about the budget as well, of course, Jamila is very important. The wedding itself, 
are you seeing and finding that the etiquette is still mainly a bride's family's responsibility? Oh, no. Why would it be only bride's family responsibility? Now I'm getting very feminist. Why, why is it so? <laughs> it's true. It's true, Jamila. Yeah, why? I think everyone has to abide by it. And and I think with the modern day where both uh, groom and bride are heavily involved in the wedding preparations, um, I think it's a must that everyone familiarize themselves with the rules of etiquette and with knowing how to handle your guests, how to approach guests, how to invite guests, um, you know, what is expected of guests or what is expected of you as a host. Um, maybe back in the days when they young bride and groom were staying away from this planning part mostly i would say yeah maybe the parents were the ones that were mostly involved with but today it's so different uh, the young generation loves to be involved in every step of the way and it's important that they know how to do it correctly because they're also handling people from different generations they're inviting their you know relatives they're inviting their grandparents um there it could be also a lot of the weddings like the i've seen cross cultural weddings uh, mm. where it's different cultures merged so it's not only important to know general etiquette rules of how you would go about approaching people how you would go about greeting people but here it's about how do you greet people of different cultures mm. how do you or handle or invite or serve people from different uh, countries so now it's global etiquette or cultural etiquette that you have to get acquired with us to yourself with so yeah that's a good point jamila Maybe we need to do an entire podcast episode about guest etiquette as well, because it's one thing to be telling this young engaged couple, you need to be thinking about this, you need to be thinking about that. But my goodness, wedding guests, yeah. they need, I don't know, they need a rule book. Maybe you need to write something. I'm really not sure what they need. They need something to tell them how to behave I was, uh, oh, I've got to share this with you. I was chatting with a bride, just messaging her on social media yesterday. And she was telling me about, she's had an Australian wedding and she's already had it. And then her family is actually from uh, the United Kingdom. And she'll be having a wedding there as well to sort of satisfy that family group. And she has decided to not have a one o'clock ceremony and then leave a massive space and then have a dinner. She's decided to have, because she's already married here in Australia, so she's just going to have a bit of a ceremony just to make everyone feel included at about four o'clock. And everyone has lost their minds and just gone, that's way too late, you can't do that. And there's been all these things that she's been told she can't do. But the guests have come back to her and asked for all these ridiculous things. But my favorite is one of her guests has said, can I bring a plus one? And she goes, well, that depends. Do I know this person? And they've gone, oh, it's my dog. Oh my God. They want to bring their dog as a plus one to a wedding. God. And she's gone, are you serious? And she's just thrown up her hands and just gone, this is crazy. And I just, I can't believe it. So, yes, wedding guest etiquette, if you could get on top of that, Jamila, and sort out these people, that would be great. Have you ever heard of anything like that? I've never heard of anything like that. And thank God I've never heard of anything like that. You know, I was thinking maybe they want to bring the kid over, but then I was like, okay, that's also so not appropriate because unless you know, most weddings in general, there are for adults. A very few weddings would have children invited as well. And that is, if only this child is very close to your family. So maybe it's your brother's child or, you know, your uncle's child, someone who's like a family knit, then the kids mm -hmm. of that family are usually allowed, at least in my culture. But I know a lot of Western weddings where it's just a small wedding, it's a no kids kind of a wedding. Mm -hmm. And I think parents should understand that there are places where kids can't go. So you can't take your kid go to a club. Why would you feel okay bringing your kid to a wedding where adults are drinking? It's going to be, you know, dancing and partying, pretty much like a clubbing environment. That's number one. You're not supposed to bring your child unless you were told to bring your child. Um, or if it's super close family, you can say, you know, can I bring my child? And then, you know, obviously the person writing could say, 
it's a no child policy or maybe they'll say yeah of course it depends but that's only if it's my brother or if it's my aunt or uncle mm. like some super close family in terms of animals at the wedding we all love our pets you know they're dear to us but would you want someone else to bring their dog to your wedding i don't really know if that would be like when you're asking something think about it how it would make you feel if someone asked you that would you like it Certain things just require common sense. And unfortunately, it feels like a lot of people have lost this sense of common sense. <laughs> I've got to agree. I've got to agree. I've heard a lot of things. I've heard many, many things. But that one stopped me in my tracks yesterday. That about wraps it up for this episode of the Umbradley podcast. For the links and resources we mentioned, please head to the show notes. And if you love the show, please review and subscribe on the podcast platform you're on now so you don't miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, weddings are a team sport. Catch you soon.